We've talked uh, uh, by phone. We've, uh, we've exchanged uh, thoughts and ideas. Mm. Uh, I congratulated him on the race, and, uh, and I wished him the best of success. And I really do hope that he is successful, because I've got two boys serving in the military of the United States. We all want the best for our country, particularly during tumultuous times. And whether it's the state and health of our democracy, whether it's race relations, whether it's our affairs abroad, or whether it's just a performance of our economy, we're fragile. And we need to move to a period of greater trust in our institutions of governance, in our leaders, and in our capacity to get things done as a country, even across political boundaries. You have said, in fact, that the biggest test that Donald Trump will face in 2017 is an acute lack of trust in the country's leaders. Has his own performance to date helped or hindered him in that challenge? It's, it's too soon to tell, because I do believe that trust will be restored, ultimately, when people feel their democracy is actually working on their behalf. And that means you've got to get a few things done. And the fact of the matter is, nobody's going to be able to get anything done unless you cross that impenetrable political divide. Because no one party has all the recipes for success or all of the truth. You are a Republican, but as a, an Obama appointee as U.S. Ambassador uh, to China, um, you sit in a sort of interesting position, I think, when it comes to politics put in the U.S. First, you put your country <laughs> first, correct, so what a diplomat you are. Let me talk to you about China, because we've had some pretty heated rhetoric from Donald Trump. How is Beijing dealing with that? I used to work for President Reagan. He said in the election of 1980 that we would cut our diplomatic links with Beijing, which had just been restored the year before under Jimmy Carter and recognize Taipei as a legitimate China. Those were fighting words, if ever there were fighting words spoken. He then went to China a couple years later. I went with him when I was a young staffer on the White House staff. So we go from rhetoric that oftentimes divides and puts the Chinese in a very difficult uh, place to winning the election and then having to govern uh, and dealing with the world as it is. So at some point, just like every president since Ronald Reagan, in every election we've had the same kind of heated rhetoric. The butchers of Beijing said, Bill Clinton, Bush got into problems over Tiananmen Square. Uh, and so this is kind of a replay of what we've seen before. Trump at some point is going to have to say, I've got to sit down and do business with the Chinese. I'm going to have to cut deals. I'm going to have to work on security matters, environmental matters, even uh, securing greater stability in the Middle East. I can't get it done without including China so at some you're point. you're not troubled by his comments about China I, today. I'm not terribly troubled. I, I've been around long enough, Becky. I've heard this stuff before. Although, uh, as it relates to the one China policy, this is a policy that both Taiwan and China buy into. So when you say that you're going to make uh, the one China policy a bargaining chip, that, that probably won't fly in the end. I want to talk North Korea. Uh, with you just for one moment. In his New Year's message, the North Korean leader said his country is close to test launching an intercontinental ballistic missile. What is your advice to Donald Trump on how to handle the North? Recognize North Korea for what it is. It's a dangerous, unpredictable, almost suicidal state. Mm. What we do know is that they've paraded an intercontinental missile, ballistic missile, in their military parades, but they've never used one. The chances are pretty good that they either have one or are very close to having the technology to launch one. So today, they could launch a nuke into South Korea. They could probably hit Japan with a short or medium range missile. Pretty soon, they're going to be in a position to hit Guam, then Hawaii, and then other parts of U.S. territories. Then we're in real trouble. So I would guess that 2017 or 2018 will be the year of North Korea. The United States will have to do something about the uh, increasing threat posed by North Korea. And um, this is where many people will say perhaps the bilateral relations with China will come in once again. Is China's control, though, over the North waning, do you think? It, it, it is, in fact, waning. Mm. 
Uh, the North has blown off nuclear weapons without the Chinese uh, even being notified about it. So every time there's a missile test or a weapons uh, test, uh, it, it rattles and shakes the region, the regional economy, which is bad news for China. So they've come from being partners in arms, marching in the same parades, party-to-party uh, 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 -party events, uh, to now saying North Korea could go south on us. They could become a failed state. They could uh, engage in unilateral action where we're, we're not going to come out so well. So my guess is that sooner rather than later, they're going to be willing to sit down with the United States, with South Korea, with Japan, and maybe one or two other stakeholders to figure out a contingency plan.